Hello and welcome back to Coming Home Network Presents, where we have conversations about the kind of things people wrestle with when they're exploring the Catholic Church and wondering if they should be a part of it. Today we get to talk about the Word of Faith movement, which is connected with the whole prosperity gospel question and all kinds of stuff that is really kind of unique to that world. Um, I'm Matt Swaim, Director of Outreach for the Coming Home Network, and if you're looking for support from others who have been through what you're going through... Um, Definitely check out our uh, our resources at chnetwork.org. You can also check out an online community that we've built that's full of just nothing but people who are asking these questions. That's community.chnetwork.org. And of course, all this made possible by generous people who just want to help people with their questions. And if you want to join that team of generous donors, go to chnetwork.org slash compass uh, to figure out how you can help us help others. Uh, so today we're joined by Lisa Cooper. Uh, she was deeply involved in the word of faith world. For many years uh, before becoming Catholic, she has so many insights to share with those of us who, to that, that's like a foreign country to us, but also uh, hopefully some encouragement for people who are in that world right now or who come from that world. Um, now, we're not going to have time here to get into Lisa's whole story. She uh, shared that, uh, well, not her whole story, the chronological aspects of her story she shared on the journey home recently, and you can find that in the show notes. But uh, we're going to get into some stuff today. Lisa, good to see you again. Hello, Matt. It's good to see you, too. So I'm trying to figure out the best way to jump in here. Uh, you know, a lot of us who are not part of Word of Faith, you know, we'll be flipping through the channels and we'll see some televangelist and we might smirk to ourselves and say, that person's over the top. They're grandstanding. They're ridiculous. They're just all about themselves. Mm-hmm. Who could possibly be taken in by one of these people? <laughs> but for yeah. someone who's in it, um, did you... Think about it that way. Like, how did you think about it where you, when you were in that world hanging on the, the every word of the, these people that a lot of the world makes fun of? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I want to be really careful about using the word cult. It's not really a cult, but it is very cultish. Um, and when you're inside a very controlled environment, and especially if you grew up in it, you really don't understand you're taught that what's on the outside of your world is wrong and that what you're doing is right. Um, and so, you know, as I was growing up in Word of Faith, you know, I never saw these men as having excess. I never saw them as being over the top. I always saw them as living in the fullness of what God wanted us all to have. And so I admired them. I gave sacrificially to their ministries. Um, because I was always taught, really, honestly, Matt, I was taught that religion was the very thing that was designed by man to keep us out of having the real dominion that we were supposed to have on the earth, and that it was religion that was holding us down, keeping us in suffering, and keeping us from having what God really wanted for us, which was healing, which was prosperity, which was joy unspeakable. Um, and so I saw these men as kind of walking the walk and tried to emulate them. And I was a, a staunch defender of them when people criticized them. I thought, well, you know, you're just religious or you don't know the Lord. I felt sorry for people who criticized these men because I thought you're just living in darkness. You don't know the truth and you're missing out on the good life. All right. So let's make some distinctions here uh, because... When we talk about, you know, televangelists and the Word of Faith movement, um, we're not necessarily talking like garden variety Pentecostalism, uh, are we? I mean, because a lot of people, you know, they sort of see sort of these over-the-top shouting preachers and they just assume that's all Pentecostals and that's what all Pentecostals are about. But Word of Faith, if I recall correctly, doesn't even call themselves like a church or like think of themselves as a denomination at all, do they? Correct. No, in fact, it's it's non-denominational. Um, they... They are not, they are Pentecostal in that they celebrate the day of Pentecost through the charisms. Um, but they are not Pentecostal in that they call themselves Pentecostal or that they're part of the Pentecostal denomination. Um, you know, the word of faith movement, and most people really, even in word of faith, don't know this. Um, they kind of point to a man named E.W. Kenyon as the father, really the founder of the faith. Um, and he was a man who, was a preacher and an actor and went to Emerson School of Oratory, which is now, I think, just Emerson College. 
um, in Boston. And, you know, in the Northeast at that time, that was a huge time of the, um, tran- it came right at the end of transcendentalism. And so you have this real strong push toward humanism after that. Um, and it's this focus on, you know, the spiritual world and as us, as these very, it's, like I said, it's a very Gnostic idea of us as being very divided people. And so Kenyon really introduced this whole idea of everything that was real happening in the spirit. We war in the spirit. We create in the spirit. We, um, we partner with God as spiritual beings. Um, and our dominion on the earth comes from the spirit. So no, that the Pentecostals do not, um, pardon me, believe that way. Um, and they vary, they differ from, from mainline word of faith in, in many areas, but that's certainly one of them. And at the same time, it's not like there's one word of faith congregation that dictates it for everybody. I mean, this is like, I mean, I mean didn't you try to church plant at one point? We I mean, did. church plant, like, I mean, I guess I can't really call it church planting if you're not like a denomination, but like, didn't you like, I don't even know what the word for it is. It is, it is considered a church plant. I mean, we were planting a church, we just weren't planting the church. In all honesty, I think there have been some pastors who have formed these sort of pseudo organizations within the Word of Faith movement to sort of gravitate toward the nuances of the faith. We're all pre-trib. Well, we're all mid-trib. Well, we're all post-trib. You know, and so you have those sort of divisions there. And those are all like in how they see the end of the world, right? But Correct. those are all yeah, words rapture. that like only yeah. a rapture person knows what you've meant just now. But, right. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah. Sorry. But if you're in this faith, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and so, th- and you have these sort of pastoral alliances where they're friends with each other. They attend conferences together and they tend toward the same, um, pillars of faith, but the nuances of the faith can differ from church to church, to be honest. Um, and so it's not like I can sit down and say, here's the creed of the word of faith movement. Um, I can tell you that it's based on almost everyone who is word of faith. Uh, let me say this, almost everyone who was word of faith at its initial incarnation um, very much believed in the um, creation of spiritual laws and forces that govern the world and that even governed God himself. They believed in the divinity, um, the Davidic, well, sort of the divine nature of man, he, that he partook of the divine nature as having complete dominion on the earth and as needing to exercise that dominion. Uh, And as a sort of subtext to that, believe that Jesus, when he was on the earth, did not function in his divinity. Um, And we can talk about that if you want to. Um, But then they also believe in a divine prosperity. It doesn't, it encompasses a lot of things. Um, It's not just wealth. It's health, it's wealth, it's joy. But that divine prosperity really is not a role like we would see of give me these things. It takes on the role of it's my responsibility to use my authority and create these things in my life. Um, and then through another incarnation, um, as it was um, heavily influenced by the shepherding movement, then it sort of, there became this, this, highly concentrated devotion to the spiritual leaders. I think that really kind of started with Kenneth Hagin. Um, I mean, people really, they worshiped the man. I mean, they would say that they didn't, but they did. They built their lives around him as though he were a modern day prophet. And then certainly, and I kind of talked about this on the journey home, um, a very experiential faith. I mean, they say that it's not, but it is. It's a highly charismatic faith. Um, and so they look for those hyper spiritual experiences to sort of define um, their closeness, their proximity to the Holy Spirit. I want to come back to Christology, uh, you know, later on because that little rabbit trail you hinted at. If I do it now, like we'll lose the rest of the episode. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but I want to ask about. Well, you, you talked about this in the journey home as, as well. You know, the, the question that a, a skeptic might say, like, why would you give money to a dude who's already loaded? Like, this man's got a private jet and like, you know, he's got every like, why are you giving him money? Yeah. Uh, you know, but also, uh, I mean, I think a deeper question is also like, why were you afraid to criticize this? And, and I can't remember if you hinted at this or if I if I heard another person connected with Word of Faith talk about this, but it, referencing back to 
um, when Saul had messed up the kingship and David was the new anointed king, and why wouldn't David kill Saul? Like, why wouldn't he just kill him and take what God had sort of, you know, put before him? And he said, well, I will not, you know, touch we'll God's anointed. Touch God's anointed. Mm -hmm. Like, how is that applied in the Word of Faith movement to some of these pastors? Well, um, okay, so if you, you know, those those five-ish things that I talked about, they're all these sort of interwoven circles. It's like this giant kind of Venn diagram where they all overlap, intersect at some point. So if you if you believe in the charisms as this sort of evidence of God working, a lot of these men have incredible stories of miracles and supernatural things happening in their lives. I mean, Kenneth Hagin himself wrote a book called I Believe in Visions, and it's his testimony of Jesus himself appearing to him. He had died and gone to heaven. He had died and gone to hell, and Jesus saved him, walked into his hospital room and talked to him and taught him this message. So when you see, hear this story, but then when this man shows up and it looks like miracles are happening by his hand, you you think that the hand of God is on this man. Um, and this happens over and over. I mean, before I even knew that Hindus, and again, let me preface this by saying I am not in any way criticizing the charisms. They are a gift of the church. But when they are utilized outside of the church, they can become very self-serving and can lead to deceit. Um, and so I didn't know that there were African tribes who spoke in tongues and who interpreted tongues. I didn't know that there were Hindu services where there was holy laughter and the kind of like, you know, hypnotic worship and things that we see in the Word of Faith movement. I thought that was unique to Word of Faith. And these men were at the seat of all of this. I mean, you know, Matt, when we were talking on the journey home, um, when John Mark and I were talking, I talked about that feeling of being in front of some of these men. And when it looks like the supernatural is happening through them, and then they speak a word to you, and it seems prophetic. Um, and sometimes you can look at things and think, well, I could, I could say something to you that would come across as prophecy just because of the human condition. But I myself had had things spoken to me that came to pass. Um, and so you put faith in that. So, you know, the first layer of that is you believe that these men are who they say they are. And at the time, it doesn't occur to you that the wealth that they have built, because most of them really came from nothing. Kenneth Copeland was poor as dirt. Jerry Savelle was poor. Bob Tilton was poor. Um, and they built, they amassed this incredible wealth. And they themselves have stories of giving things away. I mean, we gave my house away. We gave our, our plane away. We gave this car away. I mean, in early in the Word of Faith movement, you always heard that. I think once those planes started being over a million dollars, you didn't hear so much about them giving their planes away, but that's another story. But anyway, there was enough credibility there when they showed up in what looked like the power of God that you listened to them. And then there was another layer of stories of bad things happening to people who criticize them. Like Kenneth Hagin saying, someone dropped dead in the pulpit because he rejected this teaching, which at the time you don't have the presence of mind to think, well, nobody dropped dead when Jesus was teaching. I mean, Jesus didn't say- You probably you don't, don't also have the presence of mind to say, hey, can you show me the article about where that happened? Right. <laughs> you know, the news yeah. story on that? You know, yeah, you I mean, just trust just the testimony. Right. It's just some old country church that you've never heard of. And, you know, um, and it doesn't occur to you that that a lot of these men could have mental disorders like many cult leaders do. And I'm not saying that they're cult leaders. I want to be really careful about that. But they do have that. There are a lot of similarities because they believe their own magnificence. They really do. Um, and so then tied to that, and here's the hinge on this math that you were talking about, you know, why would you give money, is that they convince you of a divine partnership. And so we're partners in this, and whatever you give to me, God will count it 
to your account, which means whatever he does for me, he'll do for you. So if I say, Matt, I am going to go on the mission field and I need you to help me. And you say, absolutely, Lisa, I'm going to give you some money. I want to help fund this. This is important work that you're doing. But then I say, anybody who gets saved or touched, God will count that to your account as though you were the one who went, as though you were the one who went because you couldn't go, but you you sacrificially gave so I could. And then it became whatever blessing God gives me, he'll give back, he'll give to you. So when you give to the man of God, it's like giving to God himself. And you pair that with all these, you know, sort of cliches. You cannot give God, you cannot give God. And their own testimony is, I gave and look what God did. I gave my plane and I got a bigger one. I gave my car away and I got a new one. I gave my house away and I got my dream home. So it looks like they're being blessed by, you know, putting their money where their mouth is. And it's not occurring to you that they're being blessed because they're saying, if you give me your money, you'll be blessed. And if you're not, it's just because of a lack of your faith. Like that's between you and God, but I'm not going to give you your money back. I mean, those thoughts don't run through your head. So what's crazy is that what you just said is so close to how the catholic church thinks of herself as a mystical body but also so like off (laughs) right like what you just described is essentially like a spiritual pyramid scheme but i also know uh that in in catholic ecclesiology when we talk about you know one part suffering the whole body suffers uh when we talk about you know whatever you did for the least of these you did it for me you know we talk about um how we are united in the eucharist with people around the world who are doing things that we may never see this side of heaven like and Mm -hmm. that when we you know give to uh you know some missionary order in calcutta in some ways we are a participant like a real participant not just a uh you know an investor (laughs) right like we're participating in some real way but it's a it you know you remove the ecclesiology out of that question and it just becomes like well i'm chasing success because this stock is rising uh the spiritual stock as it were uh, but I want to get into to something because you know you've mentioned the idea of of faith, uh, you know, and having having strong faith. I mean, the the word of faith movement, you know, we often associate it with prosperity gospel. Just believe, and you will receive. I think it be can be easy to overlook the first word in the name of that movement, which is word. Like, I wonder if you could maybe unpack a little bit about how speech functioned uh, in the word of faith movement, as you recall, I mean, it continues to function, but how, what your experience was of the way that speech was treated uh, when you were, you know, fully immersed in that movement? Sure. I wanted to revisit just quickly what you had said about um, our mystic, the mystical body, because it's just like the enemy to counterfeit what God has ordained. It's just like the enemy to create a counterfeit and to take something that is supposed to be deep and this authentic connection, right? This true brotherhood that we have in the church and turn it into something superficial um, and to make it about material things. Um, And, you you know, uh, you just don't recognize that when you're in it because unless you are steeped in the truth, you don't recognize that you're not in the truth. And so it all seems right. But to uh, go back to your question about about the function of the word in the word of faith movement, so I had mentioned earlier about the the creation of the world and the institution of spiritual laws and forces. And one of those is what we call the force of faith. And the force of faith is exercised through the power of your word. And in much the same way, again, with this, this strange counterfeit of, of our true faith, in much the same way as the... Um, apostolic succession is carried out through the breath of the bishop and our our oils are blessed through the breath of the bishop that same sense of power that same sense of of the creative nature or the passing on of the god nature through the breath through the force that exists in the word of faith movement so the teaching is that god by his words created the universe, let light be, um, and so forth. 
And that because we are partakers in his divine nature, we create in the same way that God does through the words of our mouth. And because we are spiritual beings that are, that the reality of who we are is that we are spiritual, then we are to operate as God operated in that spiritual authority of using the power of our words. And they refer to, you know, there's life and death. The power of life and death is in the tongue, which is true, but it's not interpreted. It's the reality of that is not the way that word of faith people interpret that. Because they believe that you literally can speak blessing and speak cursing over other people's lives, over your own life. So word of faith is, is going in to the word of God. And we, you know, Catholics talk about proof texting often in, you know, really kind of anything that's, that's non-Catholic, but it is proof texting to the extreme. It is going in and finding scripture that points to what you want in your life. And then you make that part of your daily confession. It's not just, and some people have vision boards, some don't, but it is that daily confession. And some people earnestly and very humbly use the word of God in rightly to pray over their children, to pray over their relationships, even to pray over themselves. But it's, it becomes, even though it's preached as being very God centric, because it's preached as though I am aligning myself with what God had already set in motion. It is very person centric. This is what I want for my life and I will speak it into existence. And it presupposes that I already know the will of God. I know that God wants me to have this thing. I know that God wants me to be wealthy. I know that God wants me to be healed. And so I'm just going to use the words of my mouth and I'm going to speak this into existence and I'm going to hang on to this confession to my grave if I have to, but I am not going to let go. But there are so many stories and we hear them in the nat, you know, in natural life about, you know, I was just about to turn the corner and I gave up. And so you're, you're afraid of letting go of your confession because you think, well, I don't want to give up on this. What, you know, I know it hasn't come to pass, but I don't want to give up on this yet. I need to stick with my confession. I need to, to, to stay in there with it. So that's really where that comes from. That sense of truly power being in the word. Um, there was a man, gosh, um, Charles Capps, precious, man. I mean, really sincere. And that's something I think that a lot of people don't recognize about a lot of these faith, word of faith preachers. They, most of them are deeply sincere. Um, he was a very humble man, a very sincere man, but he so believed in the power of his words that he said, I stopped using the analogy of saying, making some reference to his watch stopping. He said, because every time I say that my watch stops and quits working and you know, Matt, it's not, I cannot emphasize enough that it's not just talk. It's not just doctrine. It's always backed by someone's account of a supernatural experience that they had. You know, we never saw it, but we heard of people who grew out an arm or, I mean, literally grew a new arm or grew a thumb or grew a foot because they just spoke it into existence until it came to be. Um, and so those became part of the lore and then, you know, part of the, the, you know, history, I guess, of the word of faith movement, things that we incorporated into our belief system. Well, I think you mentioned in your journey home episode that like you were careful not to say when something bad happened to a person, oh, poor so-and-so, like you don't say that, right? You don't say right. poor so-and-so because you might be calling poverty down upon that person. Right. I mean, that's like what it. a head game to have to play with yourself. Man, sure. Well, and it's, it's interesting because it's, I mean, you talk about, um, new speak, right? Like this very Orwellian kind of universe that you live in, but you are at first you become very careful about what you say and then it becomes part of your natural vernacular and you don't recognize how weird you sound to other people. Um, and even now I, you know, as, as the word of faith movement has gone through different incarnations, 
I think that has waned a little bit uh, just because there is this need to communicate with doctors and to communicate with people who can help you. And you have to say, this is what's wrong with me. You can't just say in the natural, but they would say in the natural, it looks like this, but in the spirit, I know I'm healed. I know. And so it was sort of this way to walk in this dual, uh, you know, dual nature of, of I have to live in the world. And so I have to communicate you know, to those of you who are just in your earth suits and you don't understand spiritual things, here's what it looks like in the natural. But then always that confession, I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I feel. Um, but I know that that God has healed me. Um, and so it is. I mean, it, it was, I will tell you this, Matt, when I came into the church, I did not sit down and read my Bible for a year because I was, it it felt like being deprogrammed out of a cult. And I was, um, every time I would try to read a scripture, I felt like I was dueling between what I had always believed and what I was grasping at and trying to, you know, it just takes a minute for truth to take root. And so, I mean, I would read the daily readings, but I wouldn't read them from my Bible. I would read them from, you know, just the Magnificat or something like that. Um, but um, I was afraid. I was afraid um, to read the word because it all just, I felt like I didn't know what to believe at first. And I was afraid that I, in my Catholic faith, what if some of this is true? And what if I'm not confessing the way that I should? And what if I'm not What if I am missing out on something important because I'm not doing my confessions anymore? I'm not in the word like I need to be. And I guess I'm saying that more for people who are in word of faith um, and looking for that way out. I had this delightful man tell me when I came into the church, come on in, the water's fine. (laughs) But, um, but I, um, I struggled at first with differentiating between everything that I had believed from the time that I could remember and learning the truth of this faith that was literally 2000 years old and had been taught, you know, I had been taught, we don't really know about the early church. I didn't even know that there were writings of the early church fathers. I had no idea that the Didache existed. I didn't know any of that. And so I spent a lot of time saturating myself in those kinds of things just to ground myself. Well, you mentioned that you became Catholic, right? And those people who've just clicked in and are trying to figure out, like, what does she mean by the church, right? Like, we mean the Catholic church. Like, we both, yeah. you and I both came from other places and are now Catholic. And yes. and I had a much better experience of Christianity than you did <laughs> prior, to, <laughs> prior to this, let me just say. Um, but... What's interesting is there's such a case that can be made uh, for really every denomination on the planet. You can find pretty strong scriptural basis for a lot of the things. Mm-hmm. And actually, there are a lot of things that you said that sound similar to Catholic stuff. Like, well, we do really care about the power of speech, right? Like, we, we do really care about what words we say. We do really believe in miracles. We're like one of the few churches that still does, <laughs> right? You know, right. we believe in, yeah. in these things that are all part of us. But at the same time... Um, you mentioned that sort of disconnect between like the spiritual world uh, and the and the physical realm. You know, you can't really produce the article or the person that's you know the, grew their thumb back because they prayed and claimed it hard enough, right? You know that. But we do have some pretty real um, and attestable failures in this department. So, for instance. Uh, not long into COVID, Kenneth Copeland made the viral rounds because he blew the wind of God to chase off COVID-19, right? And somebody like auto-tuned his sermon, right? And, and all these people who had no idea about Word of Faith are like, oh, look at this preacher, you know, yeah. scaring off COVID. COVID's still here, right? Um, but yeah. you also had, uh, you know, Paula White Kane, you know, in the wake of the, the, um, the 2020 elections saying, I claim i foresee a different result of these elections i cl- i see archangels coming from africa i see archangels coming from australia like and and naming and claiming that the election results are going to be different and they weren't yeah um and in the saddest case there was a case of a group of people um i don't even remember which church i might have been in california uh that lost a two-year-old daughter and the church for days and days and days basically spoke 
uh, you know, the power of the resurrection over this two year old girl and it didn't happen. Yeah. Um, that happened with Rodney Howard Brown's daughter. He lost yeah, his daughter. So, so what do you, if you're a believer in the word of faith movement, like how do you process that when it, something that is like really faithful, like Paul White Kane's a pretty famous preacher. So is Kenneth Copeland. This church that these people went to had probably a lot of people who are probably holier than I am praying and claiming this and it doesn't happen. So what do you like? What do you do with that if you're in the word of faith? If you're in word of faith, there are a couple of answers to that. One is it's a spiritual battle and they are prophesying the will of God. But the people on earth, you know, is the church praying? Is the church fasting? If we're not doing our part, then those spiritual forces, you know, there's always that reference back to Daniel, right? And the angel who said, I was detained for 21 days. Um, and Daniel, that's where the whole Daniel fast comes from. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but, um, that whole idea that, that there are spiritual forces that just for every, you know, archangel, there are demonic forces that fight over particular regions and, and different, um, you know, I guess, uh, well, even elections or things like that, 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 um, that they influence those things. So there is that sense of, um, you know, well, this was God's will and, you know, we weren't doing our part because again, we see ourselves as uniquely positioned to carry out God's will on the earth. It's not that God is the one in control. It's that if things aren't happening, it's because we're not doing our part. But the other thing, and this is always the out that they give you is I see in part and I know in part. Um, which is a complete misrepresentation of that scripture, obviously. But I just see, I see it in the spirit and it could be, you know, I I came from a church where the pastor every year still does it um, that I predict for the next year. But it's always could be this year, could be sometime in the future, just prepare yourself. So there's always that safety net. Um, but those of us who have come out of the Word of Faith movement the conversation that we have is this. If the penalty for speaking in the name of God were the same today as it was in the Old Testament, which means if you prophesy in the name of God and it doesn't come true, you get stoned to death, then these ministers would be a lot more careful about what they said, this is God. But you know, Matt, like a lot of things, I mean, to be Frank, how many people are watching this right now, whether they are in word of faith or not, but they've been in really bad relationships for a long time. And I don't mean to turn it into a counseling session, but you make excuses for that relationship because the loss of the relationship is more than what you can handle. And I think people in word of faith do the same thing. We make excuses. You know, when I was in it, I told myself that this is not what I'm actually seeing because the loss of everything, it, the domino effect of, well, if this isn't true, then this must not be true and this must not. And so instead of going there and watching the pieces fall, you make those excuses. And so you just, you stay and you, you know, get your confessions out and you stand in your faith and, you know, you attribute it to something beyond beyond what you can understand. Maybe this is the appropriate time to talk a little bit about the spiritual abuse aspect of this. And and again, somebody will probably say, oh, you Catholics talking about like, you know, spiritually abusive situations. You got a whole lot of room to do that. Uh, I'll well, address that. Yeah, we, I mean, we've got, we got, we've always had problems. Uh, as a matter of fact, we usually have more problems than, you know, it's a reason that, you know, we can, find a book that has all the names of the canonized saints in it because, you know, <laughs> there's most of us are are not at that level. Uh, right. But but the other thing, too, about about church history as a whole to look back on, it's not like, you know, and I don't want to even name names, but it's not like a founder of a massive word of faith community can, when faced with a hard decision, say, well, um, my predecessor, and actually his predecessor, two predecessors prior he dealt with a similar situation, mm -hmm. you know, and so here's how he handled the wisdom of our word of faith community over the past 250 years 
shows us, you know, how we should and shouldn't handle the situation. These people are all running things that they started, right? I mean, they're all running stuff that they started. So there's not the receipts in the same way. There's a certain gravitas that comes with um, knowing particular people in the Word of Faith movement. My pastor was sort of supported by, loosely by Kenneth Copeland. Um, He was very much a protege of Lester Sumrall, who was a heavy hitter in the word of faith movement. So he, they don't, they don't talk about the saints, obviously like we talk about the saints and they certainly don't have that line of succession that we have apostolic succession, but they do have what they call spiritual fathers. So they do say, you know, my spiritual father said this to me and this to me. And, you know, he was an example of the faith. And so we walk in that. The problem with that, and and we experience some of this to some degree in the Catholic church um, is that the spiritual father, the stories around the spiritual fathers become, they take on more of a folklore than they do, I think, real account. I mean, if you knew the stories about Smith Wigglesworth, who was a big, you know, one of the, the predecessors from the Word of Faith movement, you know, that he drop kicked a baby off the stage and it was healed in the air. I mean, just crazy crazy things. Don't uh, try that one at home, kids. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like I'd like to see somebody do that one and see how long they stay out of jail. Um, but they, again, they have a pseudo likeness to what we have in the church, but it's not the same. And, and the sad part is that when Lester Summerall died, he just died. They don't, you know, like I lean heavy on the prayers of my brothers and sisters who have gone on before me. You know, they don't have that. And what a shame, right? Um, that that's not part of their, of their faith and of their doctrine. Um, they don't, they don't believe in the communion of the saints like we do. And that's, I feel bad for them for that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of the, 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 the coolest parts about this. And there's, you know, there's a sense of accountability that comes along with that, um, that you're accountable to the brothers and sisters who've gone before you. That, that's that's sort of a fresh thing in my world. I mean, we all, I always felt accountable to the scriptures, you know, yeah. but I you know, I didn't feel like connected to the, the body of Christ through the centuries the way that I do now. Uh, and, I mean, yeah. I feel like every Protestant kind of has that sort of sort of new thing that they're trying to, to, to wear when they when they understand the communion of saints. But, but when it comes to some of these people, like you mentioned— I mean, in your story, you mentioned some just gut-wrenching examples of people using that position that we talked about earlier of being the Lord's mm-hmm. anointed, that whatever they speak, you know, you hang on their every word. You don't question it unless mm-hmm. you're, question, you, you're keen on questioning your own salvation. Like, are, do you think that they're conscious that their every word is having that kind of effect on individuals? Um in that way, or I mean, it's that's actually that's asking you to make like a value judgment and a I call. Think, well, but like, I think some are. I think some are. Um, I think some are so steeped in uh, um, a narcissistic worldview that they do believe that about themselves. Um, I think some really earnestly see themselves as having a responsibility over their flock. And see themselves as having been given a particular grace. But as time goes on, you know, the interesting thing is there's a pastor that I know who used to tell people before they got married, if you sleep together before you get married, the Holy Spirit, pardon me, is going to tell me and I won't marry you. And people believe that. And um, and the interesting thing, though, that no one talks about is, okay, well, I was at the wedding where you marry this particular couple. And then a few years later, they divorced. And I watched that man marry another man on television. But the Holy Spirit didn't tell you that, you know, um, I, I mean, I had a very difficult, I mean, I want to be really careful about what I say to an audience, but I had a difficult marriage that I did not have to have had someone come to me in the spirit of God and said, don't do this, don't do this thing. And no one did, you know, I mean, you knew that we didn't sleep together before we got married, but you didn't know that it was going to turn out like this. Um, And so I think there are a lot of people who believe their own press, 
But I think those people who even have a little bit of introspection are beginning to question that about themselves. Um, and I'll tell you, Matt, just to get back to, because I did have people say to me, why would you become Catholic? Look at all the scandal in the Catholic church. Why in the world would you want to enter in to something like this? And, you know, I've read accounts of things that priests have done and they've made me cry. They've made me sick. It's awful. But there are good priests. Um, the man who was my priest, Father Peter Mangum, he sat with me for hours and heard my story and helped me sort through things. And he prayed for me and he prayed over me. And he's not a perfect person because I don't need him to be perfect, thank God. But in a crisis, he was a father to me when nobody else had been. Um, and you know, I didn't join the Catholic church because I wanted perfect ministers. I didn't say I'm going to trade in this set of ministers for a new set, whole new set of priests. I said, I need to believe in something that goes beyond the person who is standing in the ombo, that goes beyond the person who's standing in the pulpit. And God forbid that, you know, the Holy Father fall into some sin but even if the Holy Father himself committed some sin, my faith is not in the Holy Father. I pray for him. I love him. I honor him as the head of our church because that's what I was instructed to do. You know, but if he, if something should befall him and we've had bad popes, we've had sinful popes, but the faith didn't stop because of it. And we never pretended that the faith changed because our leaders in the faith didn't live in the faith. I mean, I certainly understand. I've encountered some priests um, who, you know, did some things and that as a member of a parish make you think, do you even believe this? <laughs> do you even believe this? But that doesn't matter because I believe it. And I don't need my priest always to be this shining example. I mean, thank God we have ample, we have wonderful priests out there who sacrifice and who earnestly believe in their faith, um, and who lead us in the way of that faith. But even those priests who don't, it doesn't diminish, it doesn't water down the, the, um, effectiveness of the sacraments, the grace that we receive through the sacraments, even if the person administering the sacraments is full of sin. And that was what I needed. I needed something that would stand in spite of the imperfection of man. Yeah, there's this weird thing that happens every summer uh, that no Protestant congregation I ever was part of could could withstand, which is bishops going to shoot out some memo to all the parishes and say, "All right, here's the new pastoral assignments for all the priests in the area," yeah. <laughs> and they do yeah. like a little swap around. And the next thing you know, Pastor So and So has been at your parish for seven years, but now you got a new guy. And mm -hmm. I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, and right. and these parishes they just survive. Yeah. They're like, okay, well, we liked Father O'Hare, and, you know, we'll like Father Kennedy, too. You know, like, I mean, it just works. I have no, it, like, that would never happen at any of the churches that I was ever a oh, part no. of, because it was well, so it dialed into the personality of the people. We had that, we just had that happen here, and we've had some priests who've been in there, um, assigned to their parishes for a long time. And when I tell you there has been the tearing of garments and grief over, you know, some of the moving of these priests, but it, but... It has gone back to, but that's our faith, but that's the way we do it. And it has afforded us an opportunity. It's been really cool, actually, because, you know, my prayer over these priests who, who are being moved is, Lord, work in their hearts to fall in love with being a priest all over again, you know, with a new parish and a new set of problems and a new set of joys. Remind them again, you know, renew them, renew in them that love of the priesthood. And because... We are losing someone that we love and gaining someone that we hope to love. Renew that sense of praying, right, over our priests. Sometimes we grow where we're not as faithful in that as we should be. And then there's this big move and we go, oh, you know, Father Peter, you know, and we're crying because Father Peter's leaving. And um, it, it prompts us back to, Lord, watch over him, guide him, blessed mother, guard him with your prayers, lead him. 
you know, Holy Spirit, be with him, prepare a place for him and, and help us to honor this new priest who's coming in, help us to love him. And how do we need to serve him and pray for him and show up as the congregation that he needs right now? Um, and so it's, it is kind of a, it is a renewal of our faith, a continual renewal of our faith. Yeah. And it's, and it's built into the system, right? That, uh, mm -hmm. that sort of, you know, perpetually reminds us that it's not about whoever happens to be up there, right? That person mm -hmm. is, is a servant of yeah. something greater, not a person who's like an oracle, you know, uh, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, we see it sometimes, you know, even in Catholicism where like sometimes celebrity Catholic culture will pop up and you can yeah. see, you know, how easy it is for without accountability and with like book sales and with everybody telling you that you're amazing, you know, how, mm -hmm. how, I mean, this is not something that's unique to the Word of Faith movement. I've experienced it in every kind of Christianity I've ever been in, yeah, including sure. Catholicism. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to talk about suffering before we let you go. Yeah, because yeah. I, yeah, I am let's curious. Talk, ooh, let's talk about suffering. Let's talk about suffering. Okay, so... <laughs> yeah. and, and we don't have time to impact the entire Catholic understanding of redemptive suffering. Yeah. But what's it like to go from a world where it is not God's will that any of his children suffer? As it was in the Word of Faith. You're supposed to be... You're supposed to be like those guys you see on TV wealth mm -hmm. and health and prosperity and a jet that you give away and then you just get another jet. Like, yeah. going from that to this thing where there's a crucifix, you know, right up front and center in worship and you're supposed to fast and you're supposed to, like, do the stations of the cross and relive the suffering of Christ. And, like, mm -hmm. what was that transition like for somebody from the Word of Faith movement? Um, it's interesting because it's funny that you mentioned the crucifix because in the Word of Faith movement, it was we were absolutely admonished never to have a, a crucifix, you know, that Christ was off that cross, that we are, you know, people of the resurrection, which as Catholics, we are too. But, um, but it did negate the importance of suffering, you know, and, and St. Paul himself said, I complete in my own suffering, right, that which was not completed by the cross. And, and for the longest time, I guess we just glossed over that. I guess we just didn't talk about that. Um, unless we just talked about Paul's suffering, um, for the sake of, of being a Christian. But when I came into the church, believe it or not, it was permission to suffer. That was probably one of the strongest pulls that led me into the church. It was the ability to live in the reality of the human condition and then all of a sudden for that suffering, instead of it being the sort of mark of my failure as a Christian, um, and this prompting toward, you know, do, doing my, conf I need to do better with my confessions. I need to stand on my faith. I'm not taking authority. Of course, I pray if I'm suffering that God would help me, that he would relieve my suffering. But I also do some other things. I look at myself. I examine myself. Show me, Lord, where are some areas of my life that I need to clean up? Where do I need to cultivate virtue where I don't have it? And it is a cause of my suffering. And also, my, I have a, my wonderful Aunt Carol, um, whom I adore, has said to me, if you have not suffered, you have nothing to say to me. And it was really in my Catholic faith that I understood that what St. Paul was talking about, what Jesus did on the cross was not just the redemption of, you know, the cleansing of original sin. It was the daily redemption of dying to myself and uniting myself to mankind. And often, sadly, that doesn't happen in times of blessing. It happens in times of suffering. It's when I get to sit down and settle in and I am more prayerful and I can look at my brother and say, you know what? I get it. So why don't I just be present with you in this and tell you that I understand and remind you that you're not alone. And it's not always us showing up with the encouragement and the, I've got just the word for you and here's my list of, of scriptures. And I'm not saying that we don't encourage each other when we're down, but sometimes just being present with someone in their suffering because you've been there and they just don't feel so alone is exactly the way that God comforts us. And it's how we are called to comfort each other. And it does give meaning 
You know, it is part of that, that redemptive nature of suffering. When I suffer, I am redeemed from my sinful nature. If I do, if I do it right, you know, if I use it as, as a, a means of self-examination, but I'm also redeemed from my selfishness because it connects me divinely to, uh, to humanity, you know, in that ability. And I think sometimes as Catholics, we don't always do a great job of explaining what we mean by redemptive suffering. Um, but it's also, and I, I use this analogy sometimes in RCIA, you know, when you scraped your knee when you were a little kid, the last thing you wanted to do was get in the bathtub because you knew it was going to burn. Um, but it was that burning that cleansed that wound. If you would just stay in the tub until it stopped burning, then you knew that you had gotten those germs out and that the wound could heal the way that it was supposed to. And that is part of the nature of suffering, that it is burning out some things in us that need to be healed. And we don't like it. We don't want it. But boy, when it's over, we're so glad for the cleansing. Um, and, and so I, you know, people, I mean, people who aren't Catholic make fun of us because of the way that we embrace suffering. Um, and the truth is I feel sorry for them <laughs> because, um, being able to embrace something that is so key to the human condition, um, is, is really the key to being able to live a well-formed life. Well, the church gives us a language to talk about what's going to happen to us anyway. <laughs> I mean, that's essentially what it is. You know, yeah. and 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 that identification, like your Aunt Carol, is is spot on. You know, you can look at the New Testament. And you can say, Jesus, I think you've come to the wrong sort of conclusions about the way that people should live. Or you could say, Jesus, I can, I think I disagree with your methods. What you can't say is, Jesus, you don't know what it's like, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you right. can't say that. And at the same time, like as Christians, once we unite to ourselves, ourselves to that that mystery, people can say mm-hmm. to us. They don't like our, you know, ideas. They don't like our methods, but they can't say we don't know what it's like because mm-hmm. we have united ourselves to that. But um, yeah. I want to ask one more question. Sure. As we wrap things up, and that is, uh, what would you say to somebody who's in this world right now? And maybe it's not word of faith, but maybe it's a similarly connected kind of world, um, and it is their whole world, and they're afraid to get out. Like, what yeah. would you maybe say to them? What I would say is you're going to have to find truth. It's out there. It's being thrown to you as a rope, but you have to hold on to it. And so I can only speak to my own experience. I watched hours and hours and hours and hours of the journey home. I listened. I mean, if Scott Hahn had a recording of him reading his grocery list, I think I listened to it. Um, there are just these phenomenal teachers in the faith. Dr. Peter Crave, you know, obviously Dr. Scott Hahn. Um, I think Patrick Madrid has some great materials out there. Certainly the Coming Home Network has just, you know, um, the journey home and, and you know, you can watch EWTN. Um, but I would also recommend... Finding a devotion. For me, it was my devotion to the rosary, and so that's always my go-to. Um, it's always my go-to because the rosary grounded me, and I, I share that on the journey home. Um, going to adoration, going somewhere where you can just be in that quiet, in the presence of the Lord. you know. Um, but I think in the same way that you were saturated in the Word of Faith movement and you're questioning you really have to saturate yourself. And for me, you know, there were these things that would come up, you know, um, the sinlessness of Our Lady. And I would say, there's no way that Mary was sinless, or there's no way that Mary was perpetually a virgin. And as I would have these hangups. But as I had these hangups, the answer would reveal itself from the Word, right? From the Word. And so that was the beauty of it is that the Holy Spirit would show up with evidence that I needed to be able to step on and lead my, you know, he led me through these steps out of something that was, uh, you know, ignorance of faith into the truth of faith. So I would say, don't be afraid, you know, just start looking, you know, start here, start with this, start with the journey home and, and listen to what people say about how they found their way home. Well, for some people, even the fact that you exist has been an encouragement, <laughs> you know, probably 
<laughs> uh, bigger than anything that they've found up to this point. Uh, so if you're stuck in that situation, I think those are those are all good words. And just to take a step outside of your own worldview for a second, get some fresh air and go on a walk yeah. sometimes is, is, is just a huge help. But here we are at the end of another episode of Coming Home Network Presents, and we've raised t- 10 times as many questions as we actually addressed. <laughs> so uh, we'll probably have to do another one of these at some point. But in the meantime, I very much encourage you to go uh, watch more of Lisa's story. I've got it linked in the show notes here. She was on the journey home a little while ago, and uh, has, you can get kind of more of a sense of the narrative pieces of, of how this all worked out in her life. But Lisa Cooper, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Matt. I really appreciate being able to come and join you today. And thank you for watching this episode of Coming Home Network Presents. We'll talk to you next time around. Bye.